And I mentioned before, today not only do we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we also today are celebrating 19 years of ministry here in Dallas, Texas. I told Tommy the other day, he and I were talking in the car, I think it was yesterday, I said, do you realize if all I did was preach one sermon a week over the course of 19 years, that you literally would be talking about roughly a thousand sermons? That's if I preached one sermon a week. In the 19 years that we've been in Dallas, it's only been in the last few years that we decided to go with the one service in the afternoon on Sunday. Prior to that, we did do two services on Sunday, and then we had our uh, midweek Bible study, which I do want to tell you we do eventually plan on reinstituting that uh, at some point, we do hope to get that back up and running, the midweek Bible study. But uh, for years and years and years, we did two services on Sunday. Uh, for many years, I did our nursing home ministry besides the two services on Sunday. So I would go into the nursing home and preach and conduct a service on Sunday morning before our church service. And then uh, I'd come to church Sunday morning. We'd have our early service. And then later that afternoon, we, we'd have our evening service. So I cannot even guesstimate how many messages uh, have been preached in Dallas, Texas over the last 19 years. Uh, I would dare estimate... Uh, it has to be somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000, somewhere in there anyway. That does not include Bible studies that we've taught. Uh, so that's a whole separate ball of wax. It's a lot of work. When I look at my computer and I look at, you know, all these video displays that you see, the worship programs for our Sunday service and the... Uh, the visual aids that I post when I preach and all that. I create all those. I do all those myself. In a much larger church, you would have people who would do uh, audio-visual ministry, and they would put stuff like that together. I do all that myself. Every one of the videos that you see that we use in worship with music and the words uh, on the screen so people can sing along, I have created every single one of those videos. Uh, I sat and I uh, typed in the words and tried to time it so that as the music was playing, the words were there, you know, along with the timing and all that stuff. And uh, I've created over the last, uh, well, since I've been in affirming ministry now, since 1993, I've created hundreds and hundreds of worship videos that we use in worship. But then when you look at all the video uh, displays for our messages and what have you, I have got so many of them in my computer. Every time I go to the file where I keep those, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And I look at that and I think, dear God, that's a lot of work. You know, that is a lot of work that went into all that. When I go into our worship programs, and, I mean, when I'm putting our worship program together and I'm going through all the videos to all the songs we sing and the choruses and the hymns and all that, I think, my God, that's a lot of work, you know, that went into all this. A lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of energy. But, you know, there's an old saying that has always weighed heavily on my heart it means the world to me, and I believe this with every ounce of my being. There's an old saying that says, Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And I believe that. And ever since I was a kid in the pew of the Assemblies of God Church that I grew up in in southern New England, I have had a burden for the lost. I've had a burden for souls 
nothing in this world thrills me more than to be able to lead someone to the foot of the cross and help them uh, find Jesus Christ as their Lord and as their Savior. I have seen God change lives. I have seen miracles in people's lives over the last 35 years that I've been involved in ministry. I started pastoring my very first church when I was 19 years old. And uh, I've seen God change lives, folks, like you cannot believe. We had a lady in my first church. I was a 19-year-old pastor, and we had a lady come into our first church who had so many psychological and emotional issues and was bound by demons. And I mean, that poor woman was just wrapped up tighter than a walnut. And the devil had her just wrapped up tight. And I saw God save her soul. I saw her repent in our church. I saw her filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. And I saw her entire personality change in a matter of one singular day. I'm not talking about years in AA. I'm not talking about years in counseling. She was seeing a psychiatrist at the time. And she came to me one Sunday and she said, Pastor Charles, I got to tell you this. She said, I've been seeing a psychiatrist for the last three years. And she said, and this week, do you know what my psychiatrist told me? And of course I didn't because I wasn't there. I said, no, uh, Marsha, what did he say? She said, he told me that I didn't need to come back and see him anymore. She said, her psychiatrist told her this. She said, he said to me, that church has done more for you in three months than I've been able to do for you in three years. He said, honey, just keep on going to that church. She said, the woman's life was changed. If you'd have seen her when she first came in and then seen what God was able to do for her, filling her with the Holy Ghost, and oh my goodness, have mercy. I, I just can't even describe the change in her. It was night and day. It was the most amazing transformation. But you know, I grew up in a Pentecostal church, and I've seen God do this over and over and over and over again. I've seen people come in drug addict. People with, I don't mean addicted to pot, I'm talking about with very severe, heavy-duty drug issues. And I've seen them filled with the Holy Ghost and instantly delivered, instantly. And then I've known them for decades, and they told me, you know, they've told me, they said, Chuck, when God filled me with the Holy Ghost, I've never had a hankering to ever do uh, acid again. I've never had a hankering to do uh, uh, LSD again. I've never had a hankering to do heroin again. Said when God filled me with the Holy Ghost, I knew, I didn't even. I don't even care to smoke cigarettes anymore. Said everything changed. The Word of God said that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Former things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And truly, when we get hold of this gospel, and more importantly, when this gospel gets hold of us, it changes us in powerful, wonderful ways. Positive ways. That's why I do what I do, folks. I'm not doing this for financial gain. I'm not doing this for financial reward. I'm telling you, I've told the Lord for many years, said, Lord, I'd preach for free if I could just see people saved, if I could just see people filled with the Holy Ghost, if I could just see people's lives changed. That's all I really want to see. And you know, affirming ministry for me. Now, for other people, I guess it's been a whole lot easier. Maybe they're better at it than I am. I, I don't deny that. Nothing in me is so full of pride that I claim I'm better than everybody else or I 
I know how to do things that other people don't know how to do. Apparently, there's a lot of preachers out there who better know how to build an affirming church than I do because I have never in the... the uh, good Lord, it's been so long, since 1993, in all these years, what is that, 28 years? 7 and 21, yeah. 28 years of affirming ministry. Uh, I've never seen what I would chalk up as success uh, the way that I would like to see it. I'd love for our church to be full of hundreds of people. I'd love for our folks to come together on Sundays. And I would love to see an outpouring of the Holy Ghost like you've never seen before. I'd love to see people shouting and dancing and running the aisles and worshiping God with fervor and with passion. I'd love to see God healing people and filling with the Holy Ghost. I'd love to see lives being changed in the altar. There's a lot of things I'd love to see, and this is my vision. This is what I one day still hope to see. I'll never give up on that vision until I drop dead or God takes me home in the rapture one. But I will never give up on my vision ever because, folks, I know what God can do. I started telling you a while ago when I started out in affirming ministry, when I first began my foray into affirming ministry in 1993, uh, Jason and I visited a number of churches and uh, we started a parachurch ministry, you know, a non-church, but a church supportive, you might call, ministry. And uh, next thing you know, I had pastors coming into this uh, outreach, this uh, learning center, as we called it, Apostolic Learning Center. And we had pastors coming in, Trinitarian apostolic pastors, you name it, we had them. And they began to ask me to come preach for them. And I didn't know what to do. I was, you know, my partner of so many years was standing right there next to me. And, you know, I'm, and I got these mainstream preachers asking me to come preach for them. And I didn't know what to do. And I said, Lord, I can't accept these invitations. You know, uh, that, you know, wouldn't go over well. And and the Lord spoke to me and said, when I called you to preach and when I instructed you to preach, what instruction did I give you? And I said, well, Lord, you told me that wherever a door opened, I was to walk through it. That if I was invited to preach, whether it be a teensy little tiny church, poor church had no money, or a large church had all kinds of money and all kinds of members, that I was to go wherever I was asked to go. And he said, right. And I said, okay, Lord, I get the message. So as I begin to be invited into these churches, I begin to go. And Tommy, I'd been out of church for three years. I'd done a lot of stupid things in three years. You would have thought that would have changed a lot of things in my ministry and in the anointing that God had given me as a preacher of the gospel. But I'm going to tell you something. When you genuinely repent and you turn back to God, uh, the Word of God said the gifts and callings of God are without repentance, meaning God never changes His mind when it comes to gifts He gives and the anointing. The calling of God. When God calls you to preach, I don't care how backslid you've been. I don't care how deep in sin you go. When you get back, your, your calling is still assured. Your calling is still there. He called you for a reason. And He equipped you. If God calls you, He equips you. So I began to preach where these churches invited me to come preach. And we, my God, were seeing an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. We were seeing a move of God like you wouldn't believe. Now I know there are some people, I'm almost done with this portion of the service today. There are some people who say, well, Pastor, you know, uh, in the last so many years, you know, you haven't seen so much shouting and so much this and so much that. And what makes you think for a moment that you'll ever see that? I'll tell you what makes me think it is because 
I know that the move of God and the anointing of the Holy Ghost has nothing to do with me. God is sovereign. I believe in the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. I believe in the power of God. I believe in the move of God. And I know that when the time is right and when the circumstances are right, that God will do it again. I know he will. I haven't got a question in my mind. And I know, Tommy, we've had people come into our church and they've grown frustrated because things weren't happening the way they thought things should be happening. Well, I got news for you. I get frustrated things aren't happening the way that I think things are. You know, I get frustrated with it too at times. But I would talk to the Lord about it. The Lord would speak to my heart and say, no, right now this is what needs to be. I'm, I'm doing things the way I'm doing things for a reason. This is what it needs to be for now. So when the Lord speaks to my heart and tells me that, then I know I don't have to worry about whether or not God will move in a mighty way tomorrow. I don't have to worry about whether the Lord's going to pour himself out like he has in many years of ministry, uh, you know, that I've seen him do all these years. I don't question it for a minute because I know when the time is right, he'll do it again. Hallelujah. And I'm looking forward to that day. Amen. All right. We're celebrating 19 years in Dallas. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we are not having live services with people uh, in our home sanctuary at this time. So we don't have a lot of people to participate in the service today. But I've asked my partner of almost 20 years, as of December it'll be 20 years, I've asked Tommy if he would come today and just share some thoughts about our church, about our ministry here in Dallas uh, as part of our 19th anniversary of this ministry in Dallas, Texas. So I'm going to have Tommy come at this time and share some thoughts. So, to start out with, I, I think, thank God, more times than I could even imagine to count for this ministry and the fact that he has always had a hand in keeping this ministry going. Yeah. Even when to human eyes it looked very dis di very dire and didn't look like uh, we were going to be able to continue going. And I really appreciate his wisdom in choosing people to speak for him and our yes. pastor and to anoint our pastor so that we hear from the Lord. We don't just hear an interpretation. We don't just hear someone's idea. We don't hear what some organization is promoting. We hear from the Lord. Um, I was thinking just sitting there about myself and my own experience and how I've benefited from the ministry. And this song kind of kept playing a little bit in my head. And basically it goes uh, on and on. It seems to go, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. Yeah. And I thought, well, why would I think that? But then it came to me, you know, a lot of times people say that in the context of having something good and then losing it. Right. But it can actually work the other way, too. And you right. can have something bad or unhealthy right. that you didn't realize at the time was right. such. But until you get out of it and until you come forward to another point right. like I am now, yes. I can really see that. And, um, you know, my background coming from you know, 20 years of indoctrination that, that I had, um, you know, I had really given up hope of actually being, you know, what they called saved. I thought something had to be wrong with me because I just didn't seem to fall in line with everyone else. <laughs> and for that matter, you know, the older I got and the more I understood of what I was being taught, the more hateful God was and the more you know, vengeful and vindictive and just nasty guy right. was. Right. And I'm like, well, first of all, why am I supposed to love this? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me how. I can never understand that. Right. And then second of all, you know, if this is my one and only go around, why should I waste it all trying to achieve something that I don't think I can do? If, if that's going to be the end of it, right. just go on about my way. 
So I did. And, uh, but that brought me into several years of not actually, you know, like a lot of people's experience, I kind of got very hardened where um, I, I just didn't want to hear anything about God at all. I figured if God was going to be the hateful God that he is and I'm not going to gonna ever find a way to please him anyway, then why should I bother and, and I'd just rather not hear anything about him. So I'd really kind of hardened my heart and my mind to anything remotely spiritual. But in the process of doing that, it was also a physical and an emotional detriment to me. I, I would battle de depression, yes. quite honestly, because, you know, without having God in your life or faith in your life, right. everything else is, is very empty, very short-lived, very unreliable, right. very inconsistent, and um, can't be trusted. And I went through a lot of experiences that kind of reinforced that. But looking back where I am, looking at where I am now and looking back, I've had to say over and over again, God knew my heart, and thank God he did. Yes. Because he knew what it would take at that point. He knew that I would be open to him and a relationship with him if the right person and the right ministry could actually break through all the barriers that I'd established <laughs> and, and the bad experiences that I've had. And I think there's a lot of people out there that, can probably empathize with that. Absolutely. Um, so, fast forward to 19 years ago, this yeah. church comes to exist, and uh, you know I had no intention of doing anything more than sitting there and showing physical support. And my mind was, as soon as people started coming, I could kind of slack off and go on, <laughs> and that way, you know, I could at least be supportive. But Slowly but surely over time, God made sure that his word was getting to me. And he, over time, was able to address everything that I had an issue with. <coughs> yes. Um, to the point where I could finally accept and reconcile that, you know, he doesn't turn his back on you, no matter right. what right. what you are, where you've been, what you've been through. Right. Um, he never walks away from you. So once you know that, then the whole world opens up for you. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, psychologically, spiritually, um, you become much more whole and you become much yes. healthier. Yes. And you look at the world very differently. And so I have to always be eternally grateful that the Lord orchestrated things the way He did so that I could have this opportunity. And if it weren't for you being persevering through what I know has been some challenging times, to say the least, um, that may not have happened. And there's probably other people out there as well that are in my situation today and they just need this ministry to hang on and reach out to them and, and finally come in contact with them. So that's my experience and thank you. <laughs> thank you, Booby. Hopefully the sharing helps. Amen. That's the truth. That is absolutely the truth. And I appreciate Tommy sharing that. If anybody who knows Tommy knows, uh, if you know him well, you know that it's not altogether easy for him to get up here and share those things. And uh, when I first met him, I had a lot of uh, hang-ups, you know. Uh, I don't mean in a negative way, but he was so resistant to God and to anything related to God. And here I was, a Holy Ghost filled, Jesus name, apostolic, uh, LGBT affirming preacher. And uh, I never hid that from him, not for one second. Matter of fact, the first night I met him, uh, one of the first questions I asked him was, do you come from any kind of a church background at all? And he looked at me, and I'll never forget it, and he kind of looked at me and he says, uh, uh, well, uh, yeah. And I said, uh, what kind can I ask? And I was hoping he'd say, Kojic, you know, for those of you who know Church of God in Christ, uh, often referred to as Kojic, C-O-G-I-C. And... Uh, you know, I was hoping he'd say Kojic or he'd say uh, African Methodist Episcopal AME. 
uh, or, you know, uh, Pentecostal Assemblies of the World or something like that. And when he told me, he said, Jehovah's Witness, honestly, I kid you not, my heart sank. And it sank hard. Because in my experience, I, even since I've been doing affirming ministry, folks, I've had a number of people who grew up in that environment who came to me and uh, counseled. I had some people that asked me for counseling and stuff, and I counseled them. And uh, they are so indoctrinated, and they are so brainwashed, that in the end, I just felt like I, we could never break through. I could never help them. And it was sad. It was heartbreaking. And I know uh, people who come from pseudo-Christian cults, I know how hard it is for them. Uh, I've worked with more, former Mormons, former Jehovah's Witnesses, you name it. And uh, those two in particular are some of the hardest uh, to work with because the organization that they were involved in literally brainwashes you into believing that without that organization, you are damned. Without that organization, you are damned. There is no hope for you in the world. Uh, they don't teach without Christ, you're damned. They don't pr preach, you know, without the gospel, you're condemned. No, no, no. It's all about their organization and their, uh, you know, their, uh, I almost want to use the word denomination, but it's really not a denomination. But anyway, so, uh, but I've seen Tommy over the last 20 years. Uh, the changes that have occurred in him have been mind-boggling. You talk about seeing somebody's life really change. Um, and it's been wonderful. When you learn, and, and I thank God for my experience growing up as a kid. I grew up in a Pentecostal church. You know, the Assemblies of God today is not what the Assemblies of God used to be. I'm going to tell you right now. Today it is listed by the Human Rights Campaign as the most homophobic religious organization in America. And that's pitiful. That's sad. But when I was growing up as a kid, I'm going to tell you, they preached Jesus. They preached the love of God. And again, they preached the Holy Ghost, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They preached divine healing. And I saw people healed Growing up as a kid, I've seen people healed of every kind of ailment, every kind of uh, sickness and disease that you could ever dream of. I've seen people, God deliver people from their deathbeds. Since then, I've been there myself, and God has done it for me. And, uh, I, you know, I've, I saw lives change in a matter of minutes when I was a kid. And uh, But my experience growing up as a kid, for the most part, I look back at it very fondly, and I look back at it with great affection, because uh, most of what I learned, and mind you, I do not believe today everything that I believe growing up. The, the Lord has helped me to come into a, a clearer understanding and clearer revelation on some things, so I believe differently now than I did then in many areas, but I will say that many of the things I was taught growing up as a kid, I really value and I appreciate, you know. And so my experience was good. It, it wasn't altogether bad at all. And uh, I thank God for my growing up. Oh.